This is Juan Carrillo, and today I am presenting a summary of the paper titled Lanxosnet Multiscale Deep Graph Convolutional Networks, published at the International Conference on Learning Representations, ICLR, in 2019. This is the index for the sections we will cover during this presentation, starting with the motivation and the problem at hand, then moving on to the relevant background and specifics of the paper. The motivation behind these and similar papers is to design methods to learn useful representations of graph data. When we think of graphs, we might quickly think of social networks, but the reality is that graphs have applications across many domains like bioinformatics, point clouds, or recommendation engines, just to name a few. For instance, the picture on the right shows some examples of molecules represented as graphs in a paper studying the potential of certain foods in treatments against cancer. But the flexibility of graphs as rich data structures also comes with an increased complexity. We cannot apply the same deep learning methods we use for images or text on graphs. And there are also very specific problems we want to solve using graph data. So that is one more reason why the use of deep learning on graphs has emerged as a challenging area of research. Researchers are actively exploring the use of deep learning to solve several problems that involve graphs. Here in the Langsosnet paper, we're looking at two of the most common research problems, node classification and graph regression. In node classification, the input is a graph with labeled and unlabeled nodes. And our goal is to predict the category of unlabeled nodes. This problem is important for applications where you need to classify a new node in the graph based on the connections it has to other nodes and the characteristics of those adjacent nodes, relevant for recommendation engines, engines for instance. In graph regression, the goal is to predict the attributes of a whole graph or part of a graph, and such attributes are usually numeric values. This problem is key for applications in science, especially in bioinformatics and chemistry, where you need to predict the properties of molecules based only on their structure. A quick overview of the contributions. As we will see in the next slides, this model uses the Langsos algorithm to efficiently extract useful features from graphs. It also allows the analysis at multiple scales, which is especially useful for large graphs, and finally, it achieves state-of-the-art performance in two challenging benchmarks. Despite the special characteristics of the problems we are trying to solve using deep learning on graphs, there are also some similarities in terms of supervised or unsupervised learning. In the supervised learning side, we have examples of deep networks made up at the composition of multiple blocks that could share parameters, or each have its own parameters. There is also the concept of graph kernels to capture and summarize graph structures and attributes within a neighborhood. Such kernels are often grouped depending on their characteristics and each of these groups has its strengths for specific tasks. In the unsupervised learning side, we have methods like embedding propagation to learn feature representations of graphs by passing forward and backward messages between nodes of the graph and keeping track of how well the messages are preserved to produce a measure of distance between nodes in a neighborhood. Getting in more specific details, we can divide previous approaches for learning representation of, of graphs in three groups. This first group corresponds to graph convolution methods. It has its origins on graph signal processing, where the goal is to apply convolutional operators from signal processing into graphs. These methods rely on ideas from spectral graph theory to determine quantifiable graph signals. One example of these methods is the paper Spectral Networks and Deep Locally Connected Networks, which also includes a good explanation of pooling operations applied on graphs. A more recent example is graph attention networks. Here the researchers introduce the graph attention layer and show how by stacking multiple of these layers, the model effectively learns useful features within a neighborhood. The second group of models has its origins in recurrent neural networks, but generalizes the core ideas of RNNs to operate on graphs. One of the ways this is done is by applying neural networks to parts of the graph often represented as trees. One example is gated graph neural networks, where the authors extend previous graph neural networks to output sequences, opening the door to many more applications. For this purpose, they use gated recurrent units to unroll the inputs and outputs over time. Another example is the graph sage model. In this case, the authors introduce functions for random subgraph sampling and aggregation, which allows the use of deep networks on significantly large graphs. One interesting aggregation function they study uses LSTMs on random permutations of nodes within a neighborhood. This third group of methods assumes graphs and their properties are high-dimensional data structures that could be studied by looking at their underlying low-dimensional manifolds. These methods are useful to quantify the properties of graphs by applying functions over their corresponding manifolds, which is also useful to make comparisons between them. In this group, we have methods like ISOMAP, Locally Linear Embedding, LLE, Laplacian Agent Maps, and Diffusion Maps. LLE, for instance, checks the distances to the key nearest neighbors of a data point and then maps its location to a manifold while minimizing the changes in the resulting distances to the same neighbors on the manifold. Another example is diffusion maps, where spectral clustering methods use agent vectors of the normalized graph Laplacian to determine pairwise distances between data points in a lower dimensional representation.
Moving on to the specific background and methods of this paper, we start with some simple definitions. From this point forward, the terms nodes and vertices will have the same meaning for us. An undirected graph is made of a set of vertices noted as B, and a set of edges made of two element subsets of B. It is undirected because in this case we are not considering the direction of the edges. We only check if there is an edge connecting any pair of nodes. Another condition we have is that an edge must connect two different vertices, so no self-loops are allowed. In addition, we define an adjacency matrix as a representation of connectivity between nodes in a graph. The rows and columns are sorted in the same order and we set a value of 1 if two vertices are connected or 0 otherwise. The result is a symmetric matrix. We could also use other values to represent weights different than 1. The next definition we introduce is the degree matrix. It is a diagonal matrix representing the number of edges connected to a specific node. The example on the image shows two edges connected to the vertex V1. Therefore, we see a value of 2 for that node. Now building on the previous definitions, we introduce the Laplacian matrix. In the simplest form, it is the result of subtracting the adjacency matrix from the degree matrix. This form is also called the unnormalized graph Laplacian, and the result is a symmetric matrix where each column and row adds up to 0. As I mentioned before, if the values in the adjacency matrix are different than 1, we refer to them as weights, noted here as uppercase W. And if we use a weights matrix instead of an adjacency matrix, then there is another form of the Laplacian called the normalized graph Laplacian. And its formulation guarantees that the resulting matrix is symmetric. Continuing with some additional background, we now introduce the graph Fourier transform. We begin by calculating the affinity matrix S in a similar way we calculate the Laplacian using the degree and adjacency matrices. Then we do a singular value decomposition on S to obtain its eigenvectors denoted as U and its eigenvalues in a diagonal matrix lambda. The graph Fourier transform is then the product between U transpose and X, with X being a matrix storing the node features. Another part in the puzzle is the definition of a localized polynomial filter. It is essentially a function of the filter coefficients noted as W, which are learnable parameters, and the matrix of eigenvalues lambda. For this paper, the authors apply a variation of a localized polynomial filter that uses the affinity matrix and the matrix of features X, along with the learnable weights. Something to keep in mind about this filter is that it requires the calculation of multiple powers of the affinity matrix up to a value of t. And this is a very computationally expensive part. Now we're getting into the core part of the paper. The last piece we need in the recipe is the Lanczos algorithm. It was originally authored by Cornelius Lanczos in 1930 as a paper of about 50 pages. Here we only focus on the most relevant parts. The goal of the algorithm is to find a good approximation of the most relevant agent values and agent vectors of an Hermitian matrix. In other words, it helps us avoid having to calculate a singular value decomposition of the affinity matrix. Instead, we end up dealing with the singular value decomposition of a three diagonal matrix T. The inputs of the algorithm are the affinity matrix denoted as S and the node features denoted as X. K is a parameter that defines the number of iterations and epsilon is a threshold under which the algorithm finishes. The intermediate values of gamma and beta are used to build the three diagonal matrix T and we have a very efficient methods to obtain the agent vectors of this three diagonal matrix. In this case, the agent values and agent vectors of T are Ritz values and Ritz vectors. As a result, B is an orthonormal matrix that serves as a good approximation of the matrix of agent values of the affinity matrix S, and the matrix V is useful for the following steps. What follows is a reformulation of the localized polynomial filter, but in this case using the orthonormal matrix Q instead of the affinity matrix S. From the previous slide, we know the matrix Q is an orthonormal basis of the Krylov subspace defined by the affinity matrix and a matrix of node features X. This new formulation also incorporates the learnable weights. What we have on the right bar is a quick recap of some of the definitions we have already seen. More specifically, we see the approximation obtained from the Lanczos algorithm for the affinity matrix S in terms of the orthonormal, orthonormal matrix Q and the Ritz vectors stored in B. But what is the purpose of working with these approximations? The goal is to reformulate the spectral filter, so that from this point forward, instead of calculating powers of the affinity matrix, we calculate powers of the R matrix, which is the three diagonal matrix of Ritz values. In other words, we are significantly reducing the computation re requirements, especially for filters operating on large affinity matrix that result when dealing with large graphs. Having the spectral filter described in the previous slides, we now proceed to define how to learn the parameters of such filter. As a reminder, the R matrix stores Ritz values and the matrix V stores Ritz vectors. We denote the diagonal entries in R and the vectors in V 
with lowercase r's and v's. Then on the right, we define L hat as the summation of F sub E, which is a multilayer perceptron that operates directly on the Ritz values, and is then multiplied by the Ritz vectors and their transpose. And then we arrive at the formulation of the graph convolutional layer Y, as a function of the L hats and the weights. Using this graph convolutional layer, we proceed to build a deep graph convolutional network that extracts features at multiple scales. Such scales are defined with a set of short scale parameters S and a set of long scale parameters IOTA. And this is a diagram that summarizes the Lanzos net architecture. We start on the left with a run of the Lanzos algorithm to obtain the reads, values, and vectors. Then we fit the results into multiple graph convolution layers, each one configured with parameters to capture features at small and large scales. The outputs are concatenated across layers, and the resulting tensor could be wrapped with a softmax layer to do classification or a fully connected layer to do regression. In addition to the details of the Lanzos net architecture, the paper also includes a demonstration of the upper bounds for the approximation error when using the Lanzos algorithm instead of the conventional singular value decomposition over the affinity matrix. And finally, the authors also include a variation of the Lanzos net architecture called Ada Lanzos net. The goal behind this variation is to backpropagate also through the Lanzos algorithm. And this, in turn, will allow the network to learn additional parameters across the whole architecture. There are two sets of experiments in this paper. The goal of the first experiment is to predict the class of a node within a graph with labeled and unlabeled nodes. For this purpose, the authors use a dataset that includes three popular citation networks. Here, the colors represent documents across multiple classes like science, engineering, history, depend or etc., depending on the topic of the document. The authors compare versus other eight competitive methods that correspond to the first eight columns in the table. The last two columns on the right correspond to LANSOSNET and ARA LANSOSNET. This table disaggregates the results for each of the three citation networks, CORA, CITESEER, and PubMed. The percentages below the names of the citation networks correspond to multiple training splits used for the experiments. The authors use cross-validation to fine-tune the, the hyperparameters of all these hub models in case they were not available in each paper. As we see, LANSOSNET and ARA LANSOSNET achieve state-of-the-art accuracy in all three citation networks, with only a couple of exceptions in the public splits, and the authors attribute this to a dropout configuration. The goal in the second set of experiments is to predict multiple quantities for each input graph. For this purpose, the authors use a dataset with more than 20,000 molecules called QM8. In the figure, we see the counts of the molecules in the dataset according to two of their main properties, oscillator strength, noted as F1, and transition energy, noted as E1. Here the authors compare versus nine other models, and we see the Lanzos net architecture outperforms all, with ARA Lanzos net following closely. The third best model is DCNN, and the authors argue that the good performance of this model is because it also captures multi-scale features. They report mean absolute error in both the validation and test splits defined previously by Deep Chem. In general, we see that in this second set of experiments, the improvements versus other methods are slightly lower compared to the experiments with citation networks. The authors also run ablation experiments in the QM8 dataset to evaluate the effectiveness in four areas. In the first experiment, they do not use the spectral filter and use one hot encoding for the node embedding. Here they show the benefits of using both short and long scales. In the second experiment, they vary num the number of iterations in the Lanzos algorithm, showing that 10 brings good results since this number is close to the average number of nodes in the graphs of this dataset. The third experiment adds a multi-layer perceptron as part of the spectral filter to reduce even more the error. And the fourth experiment shows the effects of incorporating the graph kernel and learning the node embeddings instead of using one hot, one hot encoding. To conclude, this architecture takes advantage of an algorithm published 90 years ago. Interestingly, it turns out that this algorithm is very useful to help us extract relevant features from graphs quite efficiently, including multi-scale features by applying spectral filters. And the configuration of all these components make the Lanzos net architecture achieve state-of-the-art results in two challenging benchmarks. A few limitations that I see based on my personal view is that even though the Lanzos net algorithm is much more efficient than a conventional singular value decomposition, it might still be time-consuming and less desirable for real-time applications. It is not entirely clear to me how will this architecture be adapted to deal with directed graphs. And I wonder what will be the performance for graph-related tasks over very large graphs as I could not find an analysis about it in the paper. Thank you very much, and please reach out in Piazza if you have any questions.